Good afternoon, everybody. So thanks for coming. It is really a pleasure for me to introduce today James Albert. James is a former graduate of our very own department in whatever iteration that was in the long time ago when, uh, when that happened. So James got his PhD at Michigan working with Bill Fink. And then he went on as a, in his own words, as an assistant to a professor at, what is it? The Nippon Medical Academy in, in, in Tokyo, which was sort of a postdoc in a way that is not usual for, uh, for us in North America. Then he became a professor at the University of Florida, and in 2004, he took his current position at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And I met James just as he was making that transition back in 2004, and we started a conversation about the evolution, biogeography, macroevolution, and everything, neotropical fishes, and we're still going strong. He really has become one of the most interesting and stimulating colleagues that I have, because James is truly being one of the most inquisitive and creative and original of all of us working on South American fish evolution. And he's really led the field in ways that were just unimaginable just 10 or 15 years ago. He's led the way in, in analyzing historical biogeography and, and blending geology with fish evolution. He's also now adding a very interesting layer on joining ecology with historical biogeography and macroevolution. And he's also, of course, very well known as one of the world experts in weekly electric night fishes from South America, which involves working on anything from phylogenetics to physiology to anatomy to fossils. So he really spans the entire gamut of the evolution of, of neotropical fishes. So I'm not going to distract you anymore. I will remind you briefly that James is giving us a second talk tomorrow at the museums at the RMC. So please take the opportunity to continue listening to, to his very interesting work. And now I'm going to leave you with James. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> I can't possibly live up to that introduction, but um, I hope you'll enjoy the, the stuff that I have to show you today. Um, wow, yeah. So. Um, Thank you all for coming uh, to hear me talk. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is the biggest, I was telling you now, this is the biggest group that I've had a uh, chance to lecture to in this kind of a format before. So anyway, I hope to get some feedback from you in, during my stay, or you can contact me later if, that's, if that would work for you. Let's see if I get this right. So first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge, this is by no means all the people who I, who I need to acknowledge, but this is a list of some of the people who have influenced me quite a bit in, the, in preparing this particular presentation. And I'd like to highlight several of my local uh, colleagues and hosts here, Anand, of course, my, and my advisor, uh, Bill Fink, and Jerry Smith, who's down here as well, who was on my committee back in the 90s, who really influenced me in many ways, positive and negative, in, in directing me towards the direction I went to go. Um, and some of that you'll see today, and some of that um, I'll talk about tomorrow as well. I'd also like to acknowledge, uh, this is just because um, Javier is a former colleague. He recently passed away doing field work in um, Colombia. Let's see here. It's not going ahead. Maybe this? There we go. Some pictures of, thank you, yeah. The, I'll be able to handle left. That happens again. So photos of Javier in the field. Um, he actually perished in a, in a boat accident um, collecting fishes in the, in the Colombian Amazon. And I mean, I would have been happy to acknowledge him anyway. He was a super productive, original thinker, a really great guy. We published a number of species together. Um, he had much bigger ideas as well. It's really a terrible catastrophe. But it d does highlight the challenges of the work that Hernan does going to the field every year. Um, there's no guarantee he'll come back, so when you see him in the hallway, make sure you give him a big hug. <laughs> All right, so um, just as some, some numbers to describe the, the fauna that I'll be describing today. Uh, the, it's the neotropical freshwater ichthyofauna, freshwater fishes of the Amazon, Orinoco, and adjacent basins. And uh, we currently have something on the order of 6,200 valid species. Um, the to the fi total final number is going to be substantially higher because we're describing about 100 new species a year, limited mainly by publication space and the time of taxonomists to do the work. Um, this is a large number from a point of view of fishes or vertebrates in general. 
You can see some numbers there, something like one in 10 or so of, of all vertebrate species are neotropical freshwater fishes, not including the marine ones. This is just the freshwater ones. All compressed into a really tiny habitat volume. The Amazon is a big river with a lot of water, but if you think about the footprint of the water on the landscape, it's less than 1% of the total landscape. And we have something on the order of 40% of all neotropical vertebrates living in that very small footprint. So it's a species dense environment as well. And so the question underlying this, and I saw this on, the, on a slide, on a, on a on a wall this morning, I think outside of, of the Verbosky lab, the question is why so many species? And this is a big question we have. This is a, a kind of a coverall question for all sorts of other questions about biodiversity. And another part of the story is here, it's not only lineages, of course, it's phenotypes. And this is a montage that a colleague, uh, that a former student of mine, Thiago Carvalho, put together just from one place, not one day, but one place in the Las Piedras River in Peru showing the diversity of sizes and colors and shapes and natural history and physiology and all the other kinds of things that biologists are interested in. So lineage diversity is only a piece of this much larger puzzle. I think I've seen some smiles in the audience. If you found Waldo, he's hiding in this diagram too someplace. Okay, so here's a conceptual overview of, there's many ways to make these kinds of diagrams, but this one's useful. It helps me get to some of the talking points that I want to remind you about, things you probably already know, is that biodiversity is this combination of intrinsic biological factors that come up through the genome and the phenome, if you like, all the way through to the various aspects of their ecology, which emerge out of the, the phenome and the genome, and how they interact with abiotic external environmental factors like geology and climate, and they drive, for example, the biogeography and the population structure and the gene flow of the populations. And in turn, these processes feed back through the macroevolutionary processes of speciation and extinction to the next iteration of the cycle for the biology. There's many more arrows I could have put in here and I could have subdivided some of these categories, but I think you get the general picture that it's always an interaction between intrinsic and extrinsic factors and how they play out as the organisms interact in the wild. And for this talk, I'm really going to be focusing especially on the ecology of dispersal, um, because the particular mechanism I'm looking at river capture affects dispersal in fishes and affects rates of speciation and extinction. And then, um, I, uh, tomorrow in my talk in the museum, I'll be focusing on feeding and habitat utilization and other ways we can look at those. And I won't be able to talk about sex at all, although it's obviously really important. Sexual communication and signaling is another big part of electric fish biology and there's just only so much I can squeeze into two hours. But there's, all of these things are part of the research program of any evolutionary biologist. And this happened again. Okay, so here's the outline of my talk. Um, four uh, major categories. First, I'll introduce you to some major principles and patterns of macroevolution as they relate to the neotropical ichthyofauna. Then I'll describe the features of the fauna itself and the major features in time and space. And then I'll end up the talk talking a bit about landscape evolution, especially this geomorphological process called river capture, and um, some recent attempts we are ma managing to study this using recent tools available in this field of parametric biogeography. So here is the surface of South America. Um, wh when you just look at it, say, as a purely abiotic feature, the platform and the cordilleras, and one of the things that stands out about it is how flat much of it is. This whole central, if I can do this without ruining everything, yeah, this whole central basin in here, the Amazon basin and the Orinoco basins, they're all very low relief areas. And you can see the contours of some of the major rivers have carved into the landscape, but much of the biodiversity is concentrated in this very flat landscape. And then the, the areas that, that are uplands over here on the shields and on the cordillera have very different patterns. And, um, we can, sub, biogeographer, biogeographers love to subdivide the land in different ways and cut and slice and dice the, the pie. So I'll show you some different ways of looking at the same kind of landscape. So this is a false color image, obviously, where the elevations, the elevation differences are magnified at lower elevations and compressed at higher elevations because we don't really care too much about the differences in the Andes, but I care a lot about the differences between, say, 300 meters and 100 meters because a lot of actions happening for the fishes. So being able to visualize the landscape, you don't see this highland, or it's not really a highland, it's a lowland, but you don't see this structure or this structure very well when you just look at it as a flat map. And these are the important pieces of the puzzle I'll talk about today. 
Here is another way of dividing the landscape into river basins. Now with modern uh, GIS technologies and, and the large databases we have, we have many ways to visualize landscapes that were previously invisible to us or very difficult to see. And so now we can find more readily the margins between these two sub-basins in here. And here's another way to do it. This, in this case, it's water quality, the different kinds of waters, the three major water types in the Amazon. The clear water rivers that are draining the shields, the sediment-rich white waters coming off the Andes, and then these black water rivers that are draining lowland rainforests, each of which has a sem somewhat distinctive ichthyofauna. And here are some numbers just to show you for, in this case, it's not the Amazon basin, but the whole um, greater Amazonia, this Amazon, Amazon Orinoco Oceanus region, which really forms the biogeographic core of the fauna. These regions have a very similar fauna, um, and they also have a very highly species-rich fauna. So by comparison, there, in, when this diagram was made for this book, uh, we had hit the 3,000 mark, and you can compare it to areas of the world of roughly similar geographic dimensions on the order of 8 million square kilometers, and you can see that the numbers are much lower for these, all these categories, especially at the species level. It's just an extraordinary number of species. Not really that many different higher categories, but when you get down to the tips of the tree, there's just a lot of variability or diversity. And here's some um, pie charts. I know Bill Fink loves pie charts, so I made sure to put one of those in there. I'm joking, he doesn't like pie charts. <laughs> yeah, he likes pie. <laughs> uh, but it does graphically show you that um, the, the, there are these three groups. The, the blue are the catfishes, the, um, the red are the crassiforms, the, the piranhas and tetras and their relatives. And then in this case, this is an older slide, this, this group here is largely cichlids, now been put into their own order, cichliforms. Um, and they together constitute, you know, the, the majority of the species and the genera. Uh, are in those three categories. So, let's see if I get this right. There we go. And then here are some of the names. Of course, I'm not going to ask you to remember any of these names, although they're all dear friends to the people who work on them. But uh, the main point is that there are a few uh, really species rich orders, and within those species rich orders, there are a few species rich families, and again, within those families, a few species rich genera. And just like all biodes, this is true for the dragonflies of Madagascar and the nematodes of Australia. I don't know that for a fact, but I'd put money on it that there's going to be this kind of hollow curve distribution of, of, of taxonomic uh, diversity with a few rich species rich clades and a long tail of species poor clades. And you can see the, the highlights there, the top three groups, and for families are crassids, um, like tetras, the neon tetra and relatives. Lower creates a little armored sucker mouth catfishes and the cichlids. So part of the reason why there's so many fish in the Amazon is because there's so many carassids, lower creates, and cichlids. So now we're asking a slightly more fine level question. And of course, even within these groups, some groups are diverse and others are not. So it helps us fine tune our questions where we're going to be looking to find the answers. That's a taxonomic answer. It may not be very satisfying to you as a biologist because there's a lot more work to be done, of course, but it does help guide your research questions. Um, I hazard to note gymnotiforms are not on this particular list, the group that I most uh, have worked the most on. So these are some other uh, recent um, data sets that have, uh, that have come out recently that um, help us gauge the patterns. And this particular one is a result of this Amazon fish project which Javier was integral in, in coordinating. Uh, Thierry Oberdorf was the, is the lead pair on this, on this paper and this project. And uh, it was a project to bring together ichthyologists from all around South America to uh, compile data from all of these regions. And you can see how many uh, lots, all of these are lots uh, that were um, sampled over 18,000 sampling sites. And then this is the species richness map. This is not species density, this is species richness, the number of species in these categories. And you can see some areas are more well sampled than others, like this here in Manaus. Some areas have less sampling and probably are undersampled, like the Jadu River here. That's probably a taxonomic uh, sampling issue more than a biodiversity issue. But it gives us a feeling for the current state of knowledge in the group. Um, this is a really beautiful and interesting um, diagram of the Amazon showing the sub-basins and then doing a multivariate statistical analysis looking at that. This is species composition, the presence, absence of species in each one of these 
um, subbasins. And you can see here that there is a spatial autocorrelation. Sp areas that are more geographic, have geographic proximity share a higher species composition. This will come as no surprise to anybody, but we didn't actually know this for a fact. We hadn't done the data until you sit down and look through all these records. Um, this is actually, if you know Tobler's first law of geography, does anybody know Tobler's first law? Everything is connected to everything, but near things are more connected than distant things. So I think we're seeing that here in the case of Amazon fishes. Another interesting pattern that emerged from this study is this very unexpected uh, pattern where you have, uh, this is species richness and this is distance from the mouth of rivers. And in this case, this is the, um, the Amazon River. And we looked at it in terms of the entire fauna and also north and south bank faunas just to see if there was a difference, but it all, and, and also the main axis here. And th there's a weak but statistically significant negative correlation. There's less species near the mouth, which if you know anything about river and fishes, you know that's really unexpected. Usually there's more species downstream. There's a whole river continuum model or meta model to explain why there are more species downstream. Most rivers of the world, the Mississippi Basin, most of the major rivers of the world, is a downstream increase in species richness, but in this case, it's the opposite. The center of diversity for the Amazon Basin is the western Amazon, not the eastern Amazon, which is a puzzle. And I'm gonna provide a temporary, or a provisional hypothesis to that as to why that's the case. But before I do, I wanna mention a couple other uh, uh, macro pattern issues here, just to, we're all working with the same toolkit. Probably most people in this room have seen this diagram, it's pretty well known now from Dan's paper in um, 2010, Systematic Biology. Actually, the paper wasn't really even a, mainly about this, but it's a really excellent summary of, of the idea here, which is that species richness in an area can be due to age, where this, this clade is more diverse because it started diversifying earlier, or because it's diversifying faster. In these two cases, we're in a non-equilibrium kind of uh, situation where the number of, the reason for the species richness is due to the fact that things are changing through time as opposed to an equilibrium type model where this species has more, this clade has more species because its carrying capacity, of, carrying capacity of the region is higher. This is a more ecologically perhaps oriented pr uh, um, perspective. This is a more uh, macroevolutionary perspective. And in any given situation, you could find any one four of these things happening. And I'm gonna make the argument that it, this panel A up here is the reason for a neotropical fish diversity. It's old, it's been diversifying, and there's been few um, major extinctions to wipe it out, like there are in, the re in most of the rest of the world's ichthyophanas. Okay, and here are some re recent papers, not for neotropical fishes, but showing that people are thinking about these things. These are from last year, but this paper, Time Explains Regional Richness. This paper, uh, Macro Diversification Rates Show Time Dependency. They slow down as dif clays diversify, perhaps indicating a saturation effect. But in any case, um, evolutionary time has, is increasingly being recognized as one of the structuring agents. And this is a paper that was about neotropical biota. It did not include very many fishes in the data set by uh, Valenti Roll, but in this case, you can see the major features here of diversification is when looking across ma many different groups of organisms, there was no quick, rapid burst of diversification. Things had gradually accumulated through time uh, I mean, there are many different ways to view this kind of a diagram, but that's how I view this diagram, given all the filters we have. So my take home message from here is that there's really no huge bursts of diversification over this time frame, and also no busts, no mass extinctions. And um, the fossil record supports that too. We, our fossil record is not so great for freshwater fishes in South America, but the fossils that we do have support the idea that, support this interpretation here. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, the neotropical ichthyophyta itself. And these are the four major features of the fauna that I want to try to communicate to you today. One is that it does have ancient origins, as I was just describing, and that the diversity results to no small extent, to some large extent, I should say, from the fact that the extinction rates have been low. I also want to mention this important um, pattern that we see in South American fishes, which is that in this, these ecoregions of South America have high species richness and low endemism. And these areas in blue have higher endemism and lower species richness. So the, these biodiversity metrics are actually opposite from one another. The features of the landscape that generate high diversity give you low endemism and vice versa. Features of the landscape that give you low species richness give you high endemism. 
and I think that's not a coincidence. The, the river capture model helps explain this part of the puzzle. So these two uh, features indicate that a lot of the diversity is relictual, a museum type hypothesis, if you're familiar with that model of macroevolutionary diverse, macro diversification. And over here, uh, these two support the idea that connectivity via, re, via re, sorry, connectivity via rea capture, rea capture, Jesus, <laughs> river capture, is uh, part of the driving factors. I did title this slide, um, river capture promotes diversification, and it's by no means the only thing happening, but I'm gonna argue that's one of the important things that's been contributing. Okay, so these are some basic facts of neotropical theology that are just landmarks that stand in my head as you cannot proceed forward without knowing about Corydorus revelatus, this fossil known from the late or middle Eocene. This is the, a picture of the fossil, and here's a picture of a modern Corydorus, and this fish looks very much like a modern Corydorus. These, you probably have these in tanks because they're very common in the aquarium trade. It's one of the most, probably the most species-rich genus of, of South American fish over 200 described species. And this little highly specialized fish was already a genus in the Eocene. That's a really remarkable thing. This is a super specialized fish with super specialized behaviors and biologies. This is not primitive by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there's one in um, cichlids, and I guess our announcer probably showed this slide many times or something like it. A, uh, a, a, this is a cichlid called Gymnogeophagus. It's a fossil species in an extant genus. This is a modern genus with a fossil fish, also known from that same formation. I think you told me yesterday it's now dated very precisely to 46 million, plus or minus a half a million or something. So, so new data has shown that this is a, a, a pretty good date, 46 actually, for Gymnogeophagus. Again, a modern genus, and in this case, for announce's sake, I, I'll give a little bit more information about the genus if I can. Here's a phylogeny that was put together by the, the authors who first described it. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, here's the fossil, Gymnogeophagus eosinicus, and it's more closely related to some Gymnogeophagus than to others. These are two extant Gymnogeophagus. So this genus was already extant and beginning to diversify, if you believe this tree, by the time that this, uh, this fossil species was produced. And then there's another one here too. This is a picture of a living Gymnogeophagus. And in this, in this analysis, uh, this, the fossil species is closer to these species with mouth brooding than these other species of the genus without mouth brooding. So not only was it an extant genus, it had already begun to diversify into some modern behaviors. Um, we don't know, of course, the breeding of this species, but it's on this side of the tree. So this is not even a primitive member or a basal member or whatever you want to call it. I know there are no basal taxa, but hopefully among friends we can, I can use that word. Maybe not, I don't know. Okay, um, if you go a little further in time now to the middle Miocene, this is 15 million years ago. These are some plates that were produced in, um, on the inside cover of a book by Karina Horn and colleagues looking at Amazonia through time. And this is a really beautiful plate showing a, a scene from the terrestrial side and from the aquatic side. And uh, this, by the way, is Perusosaurus um, amazonensis. And this is an Awintathir, which is an extinct clade of mammals. And this animal is about the size of a rhinoceros. So you can imagine how big the Perusosaurus was if this reconstruction is at all reasonable. And, you know, within the vagaries of, it was a big chimen, there's no doubt, whatever, however big it was. But my main point for pointing this out is if you turn the page, you get this interpretive diagram giving you the names of all of these taxa. And um, all the ones in green are plants and the ones in blue are the animals. And all of these, extinct, all these blue uh, names are all extinct except for the Anhinga. Anhinga grandis is extinct, but the genus Anhinga, the snake birds are still extant, of course. Um, and if you look at the fish side, every single name on this plate is extant, are still alive. In other words, from the Miocene, from 15 million years ago to now, there's been just about 100% turnover of the genus level of the fauna here, and nothing has happened in the water, at least at the genus level. And many of these genera cannot be distinguished from modern species. The species, excuse me, I mean, at least is determined by uh, fossils. Now I say that, and then of course, there's always an exception to the rule. Uh, there is this um, Acre Goliath. There's this, a few scales that were described of a giant fish. These are very big scales. They don't seem to fit any um, living um, fish, any extant fish. So they, this, there may be an extant genus. Um, but I think the fact that this is an interesting observation is almost kind of like, what's the expression I've forgotten now? 
the exception that proves the rule, right? I mean, why would I be so, be so surprised that this fossil doesn't fit into extant form if it wasn't the, really the most common thing we find? Most of the fish fossils in this area are, are attributed to modern forms. And the reason is because the Great American Interchange was a big deal for the terrestrial side, but the Andes, it's a giant wall, and it really didn't do anything. The Great American Interchange wasn't a thing for freshwater, freshwater fish, at least not Amazonian freshwater fish. It was limited to Colombia and, and Panama. Okay, so these are some of the reconstructions we now have for South America. There's a number of these models that have been produced. This is a couple that are, that are uh, helpful for my, my purposes today. Um, early on, uh, the Amazon, the Western Amazon and Orinoco were connected and drained north into the Caribbean. And uh, there was this high zone here in the middle of the continent called the Purus Arch, or the Purus High, that separated watersheds on either side. And um, in the process of transitioning to the modern system with the uplift of the Northern Andes, the, there was this transient period for about 10 million years where you had this large mega wetland system in the Western Amazon. The whole system is still draining to the north, probably more salty in the north and freshwater in the south. And um, then later, after about, keep having to fight this here. After about, we don't know exactly when, I'm gonna talk more about this later, maybe 11 or 10 or nine million years ago. Uh, the, the, this eastern Amazon captured the western Amazon, forming the modern transcontinental Amazon system. And at the same time, separating the western Amazon from the, from the Orinoco Basin here, across this. So the watershed changed from here to here. And this is a river capture event. I'm going to talk about river capture. So if you go to Wikipedia, you get a diagram like this, and river capture is this curious process by where a stream captures part of the basin of an adjacent basin, and it does two things at the same time. It, first of all, it connects these two basins, and second of all, it disconnects these two basins in the same thing. So the fishes that are living in this river system experience both vicariance and geodispersal in the same event. And this is a curious event. Geodispersal and vicariance are always coupled almost by definition, but in this case, it's, a, it's the same event, and I should also mention here this term geodispersal, which is a little confusing. Geodispersal is the merging of basins, so these two basins have been geodispersed together, and these have been vicariated, <laughs> if you like, and so geodispersal is just the opposite of vicariance. It has nothing to do with dispersal. This is Bruce Lieberman's term. I've argued with him that's not a great term because dispersal implies dispersal, where it's, there is no dispersal here. It's merging of two basins. But that's a word in the literature, and so we just work around it. And so it, it does several things at the same time. It affects both processes of speciation and extinction, or at least it can, if the scales are right. So the first thing that can happen is, I should have mentioned this before I put the next slide here, is by um, separating these basins, it potentially could cause, or at least influence, uh, vicariant speciation. And by connecting these basins, it allows populations to uh, disperse, the biological dispersal between the two basins. And biological dispersal expands the species geographic range and reduces extinction risk. And this is not just a clever idea. This actually is pretty good data in the literature that this, that this happens. I'm getting a little skeptical look from Bill Fink over here, but we'll talk about it. <laughs> so it's a really interesting con possible contributor to diversification in obligate freshwater organisms. And an example of that, uh, kind of a famous example, is this area here at the headwaters of the Orinoco and the Upper Negro River here in Venezuela, the Cascari Canal. So this basin, the Upper Orinoco Basin, was in the, is in the process of being captured. So it used to drain, it still continues to drain into the Orinoco, but the erosion from the Upper Negro has bitten off a piece of it here, so now the water splits. And depending on the vigors of rainfall, it will either flow this way or this way. And Eventually, the projections are that the upper Orinoco will become a tributary of the upper Negro, and this big U-turn in the river marks the river capture event. And it's gonna do both things that I mentioned before. It's going to both separate the upper, upper, upper and lower Orinoco, and it will connect the upper Orinoco and the upper Negro, allowing fishes, as they do now, to swim back and forth. So the Cascari Canal is a big river, I mean, it's in a place, it's a remote place, so ocean-going vessels can't get there, but it's big enough to support ocean-going vessels. It's a big river, it's a big flat lowland river here. But it's embedded in a granite shield here, uh, so the river capture event is, is, is slow. It's taking thousands or who knows how many tens of thousands of years. It's not happening as fast as it would, say, in a muddy platform. 
Okay, so um, there's some more uh, uh, geological pieces of the story that I'm going to introduce to you. And uh, for this, I'll take you to two chapters in this book that we published in 2011 on the biogeography of neotropical freshwater fishes. And here's the list of the table of contents, and here's a close-up of two chapters that I'm going to highlight. One is actually uh, Renanza, the lead author, looking at radiations in, the, in North and South America during the Paleogene, and then what happened afterwards during the Neogene in the last 23 million years. And the argument here in this pair of chapters is that the diversity was largely formed, the functional diversity and the genera, the phenotypes, uh, were largely formed here, and largely what has happened in the last 22 million years has been the reshuffling of the decks on the Titanic, no, on the, on the ship. I mean, it's, it's been reassembling, re-emerging the fishes. There's been some speciation, but not that many new forms have evolved. The fauna is old, and what we see today is the mixing of them to form the faunas by dispersal and extinction. And here's the time frame, so from the upper Cretaceous up to the recent. And you can see that uh, the, the Neogene is a relatively thin slice of the last 14% of this entire time interval. And most of the evolution took place in all of these many eons before that constitute the bulk of the time. Um, throughout this time, the, the arena of diversification, there was no Amazon yet, the arena that these animals are diversifying in was the sub-Andean foreland, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. And then over time, it got broken up by the rise of several structural arches, the Mishikola Arch, and then later the Valpez Arch, which is still uprising, uplifting, and then at the last little time horizon, the Fitzcarraldo Arch. And I'll show you where all these three are. So here's a Google Earth map of South America, and this is the, not yet, this is the Sub-Indian Foreland. Um, the Andes are big mountains and they're heavy, and they depress the crust around them. And on this side, the, the, whoops, the crust is, um, the, is, it creates a, a, a trough here. And for most of the last 100 million years, this has been the main water uh, evacuation route for the continent. Most of the, um, uh, most of the fishes that we think of the Amazonian fishes were living in this basin. Early on during the Paleogene, around 35 million years ago, with the formation of the orocline in the Andes, you have the uplift of the Michicola Arch, which began, it isolated this area to what's now the Paraguay Basin. Um, the Fitzcarraldo and the Valpez Arches here in these parts. So that today we have um, this, sorry, pardon me, I'm trying to ha get a handle on this complex machine here. <laughs> so currently uh, we have this basin draining the mid upper Madeira Basin, and we have these basins of the Western Amazon, and then we have the Orinoco because of the uplift of these three arches which broke up the Sub-Indian foreland. And here are the names of some of the current basins, the structural basins that were formed during the Neogene because they were not uplifted. This Ukamara Basin is a composite of a, several, of a bunch of smaller basins that I'll talk about in a minute. And then for those of you interested, these are some other interesting um, geological features um, to keep track of, the Nazca Ridge and the Galapagos Hotspot. Okay, so based on that uh, thinking, a uh, former student uh, in my lab, Victor Tagliacolo, some of you know, uh, compiled this uh, data set of pimeloated catfishes, these large body migratory catfishes that are diverse in the Amazon, and uh, made a time calibrated phylogeny. Catfishes have spines and therefore a better fossil record than electric fishes. There is a little bit of a fossil record of electric fishes, but these catfishes are, have a much more well constrained time frame. And then we used. Um, uh, this tree, uh, well, so first of all, I'll point out these red bars show um, all of the species. Let me put this in here. The, uh, all of the introductions of species into the eastern Amazon. And uh, it, the only one that didn't occur at that time is this species here, but this is not very well constrained because only, we only had one uh, species to work with. But for all the groups for which we had a number of species that didn't have a very long branch, they all got. Into the, into the Eastern Amazon in this very narrow window of time. Sorry, no, not the Eastern Amazon. They got into that's this river capture event here. So the original watershed was the rise of the Michicola Arch and then the rise of the Fitzgerald Arch, which caused this river capture reversal, and then finally here. So the modern drainage is draining north, well, at this time, and then eventually it will drain east. So uh, the title of the paper was Biogeographic Signature of River Captures. And we published these diagrams showing when we think these river captures occurred as estimated from the pimeloated catfishes. 
That's, that's where this, this, this hypothesis came from, pimola catfishes, no geology, in 2015. And in 2017, Garziono et al. published this diagram. Look at the times. This is their times. It's almost exactly the same. And I wrote uh, Garzioni, and I asked her what she thought about this, and she, and as I, I put these arrows on, I said, does that mean the rivers were going in this direction? And she wrote, yes. <laughs> Geological data on the Altiplano uplift are consistent with the interpretation of a mega river capture events in the Sub-Indian foreland. So that's an email, but nonetheless, when I saw that, my, I, I couldn't believe it, because what are the odds that ichthyologists are gonna predict geology? That just never happens, right? <laughs> And so I thought, this is real. This is not just us having fun. We actually maybe discover something about the continent, not only about pimelod catfishes, but about many groups of fishes that inhabit these same basins, and maybe other animals too. So for example, here's a tree that was published uh, recently. Uh, it's a group of, of Australia, uh, Australia here cichlids. It was largely focused on the ones in the south, and they had a few outgroups, but they dated their origin of the cichlids into the south in this time frame. This is the origin of the southern clay here. Same exact time frame. Well, I put that bar on there, and, and their um, time calibration overlaps pretty well with it. And you know that these time calibrations are rough and ready, and there's many ways to play with calibrations. But they weren't trying to calibrate their clock to our time frame. I'm just showing you what they reported as their best guess for Australiaheros. Here's another group from uh, a group of uh, hyposomous catfishes uh, that also have distribution around South America. And these are the groups that evolved into the south. And you can see that one evolved during this time frame and four others evolved almost immediately afterwards. I don't know if this is consistent or not, but this is what was found. Seems to be there may be some signature of this major river basin and these major river capture events are affecting different animals. Um, this, is, this one's even more clear now. I'm leaving the fish world, but I'm going to the caimans. And so there are uh, two species that live in the south. Yacare and Laterostris, each of them, the nearest relative, lives in the Amazon. And here's the time calibrated phylogeny. Caimans have a way better fossil record because they're caimans. They have a lot of bone and they're much more well studied. So there's a, quite a good fossil record of these guys. And here's the time frame. Excuse me. For the origin of those groups in the south. So it looks like this, this signature of this geographic event might have affected the caimans as well, the caimans. Um, and I also found this paper, there's actually quite a few of these things, I just started collecting them. Was I cherry picking the literature? You betcha. But there seems to be that, it, it's, a, it's a possibility that this event left a signature across a wide range of taxa. I have no idea why they said, they said that, <laughs> that these groups, excuse me, <coughs> colonized the South in this time frame, um, and they give it a name for this corridor for the origin of this thing in the South, of, of these platyrene primates. So, I mean, I don't know why they, chose to uh, emphasize this, but it could be that. I don't have any reason to, to ask why primates, which don't live in rivers, would follow the same pattern, but maybe they're following quarters of force or something like that. Okay, so this is a, recon a reconstruction, again, showing you what I showed you before about these, uh, this mega river capture event of the Amazon. And uh, you could summarize it like this. This is a cartoon, if you like, of the Eastern Amazon, I don't know the full boundaries of the Eastern Amazon 20 million years ago, but this is the modern Amazon and dividing it roughly along the Pudus Arch, showing the idea that the Western Amazon was draining into the Orinoco and it was separated from the Eastern Amazon. So the Amazon in those days was not a muddy river. It was a clear water river draining the shields. And then there was this change of the watershed from here to here, creating the modern Am transcontinental Amazon sometime. And the date of that is highly contested and has been subject of a lot of debate for many years. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. But before I do, I couldn't resist throwing this one in here, um, basically to honor Jerry, because we, I was talking about this before. This is the, the river capture curve of paper. And um, one of my students and I collected data on 40 river capture events from all around the world. And we got an estimate of the size and the age. If it's on this data, if it's in this data set, because we could make such an estimate from the literature. Many, many river captures or other river capture events have been noted in the literature by geologists. but uh, they didn't give us enough information to do that. And then we were going to try to correlate those, those features with uh, species richness in this particular uh, paper. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, of data behind all this, but I wanted to show you that these 40 river captures, if you put them here on a plot of area, this is log area and log, uh, um, sorry, this is area and this is age, an estimate of their age. You see that there's a significant correlation with a lot of scatter 
of the, um, of the basin. So the older the river capture event, the bigger it is. So what happened to all of the, what happened to all of these guys? Or, or are there any old small ones? If they were, they would have been erased by the bigger ones because river capture events overwrite the signature of younger ones, of smaller ones. And over here, I just don't, we just, they just don't happen very frequently. All the, these river capture events are, you know, a million, 10 million, 100 million years old, and we don't have very big river capture events in the last 100,000 years. This one right here is the one I just showed you, the biggest river capture, not the oldest, but the biggest river capture event of, that I know of in the history of the planet. Uh, the continents are bigger now than they've ever been, so this might really be the biggest river capture event in the history of the planet the one where the Amazon changes from a north to an easterly flow. Now, um, let's take a look at how that might, uh, or how that actually occurred in more detail. So, um, as I mentioned, there are many age estimates from when this could have happened, and they range from kind of ridiculously young to probably reasonable dates, especially around the mid-Miocene, around nine or 10 million years ago. The ones in um, red are more recent um, studies that he added more data and also synthesized previous studies. So I'm, I'm, I put more weight on these three particular studies, and they had dates in the, in, in the range of nine or 11 million or something like that. This is one of them. This is from a, 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 th a thesis by a Dutch student, Van Solen, and her, and her colleagues. Uh, the paper is here in Earth and Planetary Science Letters. And here's one of their figures. They have a number of these. This is a particular core taken from this particular ODP site off the mouth of the Amazon. And uh, you can see here, these, these are stable isotopes of an element neodymium and how they change through time, and then their interpretation of what it means. And just to cut to the chase, they say that the initiation of the Amazon fan occurs around 10, slightly close to 10, and the excision of the Quito's arch occurs around 4.5. These are two really important events, I think, in the origin of the Amazon. And if you put these dates, um, oh yeah, this is some of the dates that they had, and just to, again, to cut to the chase here. This is their um, expression. The onset of transcontinentalization was not a single event. And of course, as soon as I read that, I realized, of course, the formation of the biggest river system on the planet probably didn't happen overnight. In fact, it may have happened over a period of several million years, maybe four and a half million years. In, in, in multiple events. So here are those two dates. One of them um, is right here in the middle of where these other dates were, and one of them is interesting here at about 4.5, which if you know this literature has been, uh, uh, there's been an argument out of the bird literature for a long time that this is the date for the origin of the modern Amazon, which the fish people always thought was too young. Um, but it might be that there were several events and that a large amount of sediment did enter from the Andes into the Amazon at this time. So um, here are the major structural features of the continent that I'm going to ask you to pay attention to as I reconstruct this model. <coughs> we have the, the Andean arc over here, a volcanic arc, very young. The oldest bits of the crust are these cratons, the Amazon craton, which is partially buried by the Amazon here, and other pieces of craton. These are really old Precambrian granites that go back to the origin of the continents uh, several billion years ago, other pieces of it over here. And these form upland areas that have been around for a long time, and these form uplands that are relatively young in the last 50 million to 10 million years. Here, just for a reference, is the margin of the Amazon, modern Amazon basin. These are structural arches, and a structural arch is an enigmatic um, uh, structure, <laughs> uh, phenomenon. They are, they are um, um, sub-basement highs. So you, wherever you have sediments, if you have an, the basement, whatever that is, that's higher than the surrounding basements, that's called an arch. So it's not um, a natural group of things. Each one of these arches has a very distinct history. They're formed by different processes, and so to group them together into a single category is a bit artificial. But what they do is they provide boundaries to guide the flow of the rivers through time. So these are the basins that have been accumulating sediments between the arches for tens of millions of years. Even if they're buried right now, the Amazonas Basin is a separate sedimentary basin from the Solimoas Basin from these basins of the Western Amazon. And then I'm going to take a close look at these two arches because they're kind of central to our story. The Pudus Arch here that separates these two sedimentary basins 
and the Valpez Arch, which separates the Western Amazon basins from the Orinoco basins. So here's a close-up of, close of the Valpez Arch using seismic imaging. And here we are, I don't know if you can see where this red line is here, that's what this transect is through here. And it's cutting right through this Valpez Arch. The Valpez Arch is Precambrian granites. This is the Ghana Shield that hasn't breached the surface, it's been buried by sediments. So these are Paleozoic, two more recent units over here. So this is not an imaginary thing, this is an actual thing. It's rock. The same with the Valpez, uh, with the Pudus Arch. So the Pudus Arch here is actually the buried portion of this magmatic band from when back in the Precambrian, back in the Proterozoic, when the Ganesh Shield was being formed, the oldest rocks were here, and various island arcs were created onto the margin here. And this so-called Vetuari Tapajoas uh, volcanic arc is what is the Pudus Arch. The Pudus Arch is a inverted graben. There's an inverted graben for you. What happened when these two areas were compressed, causing this thing to uplift, and then it got buried later by the Amazon. And there's a long history known about the, the Pudus Arch. Um, it served as a topographic high, as I mentioned earlier, throughout most of the Cretaceous and Cenozoic, and it only became um, uh, buried with the, excuse me again, with the formation of the modern Amazon. So here's what the, the drainage basins would have looked like. We have to separate sedimentary basins and drainage basins. Geologists do this without thinking about it. Biologists, I had to think about it, but I think I've wrapped my head around it now. So the early drainage basins were flowing in the eastern Amazon was flowing like this, collecting water off these arches. And the western Amazon was collecting all of the sediment-rich waters off the Andes, flowing north through the Sub-Indian foreland, and originally out into uh, Lago Maracaibo, but then as the Andes uplifted, uh, this basin was being shifted progressively east throughout most of this period. And this is the period when most of the evolution of the fishes occurred. This is the landscape that matters when you're trying to reconstruct anything about the evolution of these animals. And then there was this transitionary period when the Pavis Mega Wetland and Akare systems were forming in the west, when um, at least this basin was being captured and carrying some Andean sediments. We don't really know what was going on here. Uh, it looks like they were not, because this is the Iquitos Arch. This didn't get breached until 4.5. But um, this was not draining north. So it's a bit of a puzzle for me, but it looks like the water was flowing, but the sediments were not. How does that happen? Well, I don't really know, but here's a model for that on the Susquehanna River where the water flows and the sediment doesn't. So it could have been the Quito's Arch was a natural dam that lasted for three or four million years, damming up sediments on, on the upstream side of it. Maybe some sediments were flowing, but not all of them because eventually it was breached and then you get that big sediment signature at the mouth around 4.5. I never promised you geology was gonna be simple. This is actually relatively simple. The real story is even probably more elaborate because I've only got two river captures and almost certainly the formation of the Amazon involved multiple river captures, right? We just don't have the data yet to support it. And that's one thing I hope um, geologists and biologists are gonna be doing is going forward is looking for more of these data. This is a really cool map, oh, sorry, of the Amazon showing the flooding. Like this. The, the amount of the time that the areas are inundated. And so you can see the, the Llanos here, uh, the, the Ucamara Depression, the Kaya Samir Reserve here. This is the Varze of the Central Amazon, other wetlands areas. And you can see these wetlands areas form in the middle of these structural basins, these sedimentary basins, especially this one here. This one here, not so much, although they're, they're, there's the, you can see the shields come much closer to the river over here. Here's my cartoon drawing with the colors in blue proportional to the number of months inundated. You can see that we have all of these wetlands here in uh, South America, and uh, they, form, they, they cluster around the middle of these sedimentary basins. And the Bacaya Samiria, uh, that's the name of the national park, um, it's the Ucamara Depression, is sitting in this, it's even today, it's still a sediment trap, even today, sediments are accumulating in this basin. Of course, many of them are flowing down the Amazon as well, but this area is, is still not uh, erosion zone, it's still a depot zone. So here we are in the most recent time slice after the, all the pieces of the puzzle have been put together. Um, other things have collected in too that we don't know as much about, but there's a river capture across this watershed that some people in this room are interested in. There's another interesting, fascinating story about the Pantanal here in Paraguay and its connections um, to the Amazon. And here is the model. 
These are sort of easier to read ones. This is a block model that we can input into biogeographic software because our software programs are clungy that let us, um, you know, model in landscape in in in, um, in landscape evolution slices. This is the landscape evolution model of the origin of the Amazon. Actually, it starts from here and goes backwards in time, this uh, forward in time, this way. Okay, um, just to show you that there's some other geology behind this too. Uh, this is a really cool paper that came out. Uh, this is actually not the most. This is the one that was on PeerJ, and there's, it's been published again now this year. Just just came out as a published form by a uh, Finnish team, Ruka Linen et al. And they were looking at these landscape uh, maps generated by radar penetrating, um, sorry, canopy penetrating radar. And they could look closely and find all of these paleo channels connecting a lot of the rivers in the lowland. We'll take a closer look here at this zone. And uh, here's the Japura River, a whitewater river, and the Negro River, and a tributary that are coming in. And then we'll look even closer at this little thing here, and you can see that there's this tributary that connects the two. Um, on not too distant past. They interpret this as on the order of tens of thousands of years ago, there was a large river that ran from the Japara into the Negro, bringing with it a lot of white water and probably making the lower Negro much more muddy than it is today. And they showed this across um, many of, of, those, of those things I showed you. I don't have time to show you all of the cool things that, that are being discovered right now, but this one particularly stands out. There are these sediment differences as you cross the Quito's arch uh, in this area between what's known as the Isa formation and the Solimoas formation. Actually, uh, they're called Isa and Solimoas in Brazil and the Pavas and Nauta, I should get those backwards, in um, Peru. So if you're reading the literature, it's confusing because they have different names for the same formations. But there's this really clear, distinct line that separates them. You can see it here on one of those um, radar, uh, canopy penetrating radar images with the Isa formation on this side and the Pavos formation on this side. Now, the reason I'm asking you to pay attention to this is that the Isa formation is on top of the Solimoas formation. So this is higher than this. Now, if you think about it, that's not expected because the sediment flow is going downstream. The erosion wave is also going downstream. That doesn't usually happen, right? Usually, the erosion front moves away from the sediment flow because the sediment's carrying erosion away and you get a propagation of the sediment flow upstream. But in this case, they're parallel with one another. This is, I've never seen anything like this. When I pointed this out to the authors, they didn't have a good explanation, but I think I have an explanation. The explanation is paleogeography. This is the conditions in which these sediments, this is all, oops, sorry about that. This is the older formation here, and this is the Pavos system when it was draining north. When this, prop, when this erosion front got started, it was the headwaters, and it was going in the correct direction upstream. But then you have this huge river capture event that overwrote that signatures, but the erosion front continues. It's a ghost erosion front passing downstream in the same direction as the sediment flow. So the sediments come out of their, of their horizons and take a U-turn and go downstream again. And this is an example of a, of a non-equilibrium situation. Ultimately, this erosion front will sweep downstream, and the system will right itself so that the erosion waves are going upstream the way they're supposed to. OK, I'm now going to ask you to, to, that was a geological example, and I'm going to look at one in terms of biogeography. Um, what, what's my time on this? Yeah, OK. Um, I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit. I went slower than I thought. If you don't know about parametric biogeography, I'm going to ask you to read up on it. <laughs> but I will say that we did the study for two groups. We did a study on stingrays, for which we have um, uh, fossil evidence from their teeth. So this is good for time calibrating the tree. And what we got, was, we, and then we compared two time, um, um, two models of uh, two landscape evolution models. One was a one slice model using the modern landscape. And then we said, how well does the, does the Potamus trigona tree fit this landscape? And then we did another one, which is a two-time slice model split at 10 million years ago. And so here are those two uh, models. And the answer is right here in the, in the likelihood values, minus 60, minus 52. Less negative is better. So this is the better fit. According, using this approach, we're able to compare between the two, and we conclude this is the better fit, the two-time slice model, where you have different landscape, uh, landscape connectivities uh, across this time horizon, is a better fit to the Potamus trigons than this one. 
we also did it. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead here. Sorry about this. I just want to mention this before I quit here. Oh, I should mention, it does predict this, that the Eastern Amazon is, has multiple origins. And also in here, there's hidden in here, it's from Eastern Amazons. Just the colors aren't as obvious. And this implies a Western Amazon to an Eastern Amazon dispersal route at 10 million. And the same thing we did for the afternoon at Electric Fish, and it was the same story. The two time slice model was a better fit. And the Eastern Amazon fauna was polyphyletic. Okay, I think I'm not gonna go on from there because I have a bunch of bird examples. Um, the bird people, you can wait till later. Uh, that showed the same thing, and, and actually there's some plant examples as well. And the rest of my talk was about those other examples. But the main take home message here is that, oh, I will mention this. Um, we have a lot of examples of time calibrated fish phylogenies to go through. We only so far have looked at those two. And there are many others that can be probed to see if we find the same signature of a Western Amazon to Eastern Amazon dispersal at 10 million years ago. And with that, I think I, I do want to leave a few time, minutes for questions, so I'll just leave it at that. But thanks very much, and I apologize for going, running a little late. A couple of minutes for questions for James, if anybody has any. Yeah, it's a, it's, so the question is, are genera comparable? And absolutely not. Um, even among fishes, they're not comparable. It's, uh, it's an arbitrary rank. So that's, that, that's not really the strength of the argument. The strength is that when you look at the terrestrial fauna, whole groups are extinct. We have no condylarths. We have no xenarthrins. We just don't have the major vertebrates of, North, of South America after the Great, Amer the Great American Land Bridge, right? Uh, the Great American Interchange. All those land mammals came south. And not only mammals, but plants and, and many other animals, both directions. And for fishes, there's just no evidence for that. There's neither, either direction. The, the uplift of the Isthmus of Panama didn't affect the Amazonian fauna in one way or the other. No, nothing really left, and nothing came in at that time. Because the Andes, this is a giant wall. And, and so you could do it on a clade level. There's a, you don't have to pick a genera. I was doing a shorthand here because it's, it's faster. I ran out of time as it is, but yeah. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. That's expected with nothing. That's the expectation, at least as far as my reading of the literature, that's a neutral expectation. If you didn't find that, basically it's a, it's a, it's a comb. It's a, it's a phylogenetic comb where one of the two branches is always more diverse than the other one. And, so, and, the, and apparently neutral models generate that pattern commonly. So if you don't see that, it's very rare that people don't see that, but if you don't see that, there's some biology that's structuring it. I would say the neutral expectation is that very hollow curve distribution. So that's, there's an argument, if you like, that nothing happened in Amazon fishes. Not, not a popular answer, but there are many. See, the problem is that there's lots of biological processes that will produce the same um, unbalanced cl clay distribution as well. It's not a particularly diagnostic signature of anything. But it is true that the, that the Amazon fish fauna has that, that distribution. Gary. Uh oh, here comes the second part of that question. But, he says it's great that I'm testing hypotheses of fish with, ge with geological data. But. but <laughs> no, uh, on another subject. Oh. In North America, we also have uh, big development of the Portland Basin fish fauna at 10 million. And another development at 4.5 that seems more related. It's a really good point. Um, 4.5 is remarkably close to the uh, Pliocene-Pleistocene boundary. And it could be that that's a signature of increased rainfall. 
and just more erosion dumping a huge amount of sediment. I thought about that. I don't have, I haven't looked at that. It's a little early. Usually people are thinking a little bit later than 4.5, but, but I don't know about those two North American faunas. With that. What's the foreland basin that you're talking about in North America? Yeah, it's along the eastern front of this year. Oh, okay. But, uh, but it was, oh, I see what you're saying, sure, right, yeah. And so a lot of the stuff that's elsewhere in the continent, on the western part of the continent now, uh, seems to trace back to that Oh, I'm going to sit with you and talk to you more about it. I have been trying to follow the Paleo Mississippi uh, literature, and apparently the new thinking is that it was always draining north for the longest time into the north, into the and, and only kind of recently, and since the Quaternary maybe became a, a Gulf of Mexico thing. But yeah, yeah. Well, back to the first point, it's good that you're not simply accepting the geologic information and fitting the fish to it. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's a there's a uh, we so the the yeah biology and geology have this interesting relationship where we just assume that the geologists are right and then we give them our data and then we either match what they say or they don't say. And um, some areas are more well known than others. One thing we really don't want to do, and John Lundberg's made this point for many years, we don't want to give the geologists dates based on our biological dating for them to use because they would love to do that. There's a new uh, branch of of, bio, of, uh, of geology, which is trying to date geological events using biological dates, which I think is really unwise for us. Not to mention that our dates are always very flabby. We don't have precise dates like they have. But also, it just makes it hard. It becomes more circular and harder for us to, yeah. So I, I, I agree with you on that one. <laughs> Nevertheless, we have good things to teach them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. Anyone else? Thank you very much, James. Thank you. Sorry, I know.